Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Maria Lafayette Khan. Um, it's an honor for me to come here today. I was actually quite surprised that I was invited. I thought, little old me, I'm just a normal, regular person, which actually, this day and age, when you see the weirdos out there, it's a pretty good thing. Um, I here to talk to you because I actually I like this subject, uh, embracing change. To me, that kind of encapsulates my life since the age of 27. I have been changing myself, reinventing myself since that age. And I have sometimes willingly embraced change, and then sometimes I have forcibly embraced change, which is something that we all have to go through at one time or another. For me, what defines whether you actually embrace change for the benefit of you is actually it's your attitude. What attitude do you take? We just heard Mohamed Dutta speaking so well about his experience. Even from the, the worst things, you can always take a good experience away. It's positive attitude you have. The more positive you are, the greater the benefit that you will get. So if I apply this to myself, um, the way I look at it is like, okay, who am I today? That is what I'm looking at. I am Maria Rafika Iqbal. I am a compulsive philanthropist. I run three charitable organizations. I am the founder of some and I am the co-founder of others. Uh, my first charity is Rising Stars Foundation, which educates over 1,200 children in Swat and in Uchri. The second is Labour and Love, which provides income generating opportunities to impoverished women in Lahore. And the third, which is my favorite, is the fundraisers, which we do a bargain basement sale where we get designers to donate items and we sell them at 50% off to raise money for charity. The person that I am today is not the person that I thought I would be when I was 27 years old. The person that I am today, however, is a truer and a better version of myself. And that is thanks to the changes that I have gone through. For me, change is good. Change is a challenge. It um, allows you to find out what your inner strength is. It also teaches you to find out really what motivates you. What is the thing that actually brings you happiness? The earlier you can find that out in your life, the better your life is going to be. The quicker you will be on the path that you were meant to be. So let me go to who I was at age 27. Well, at age 27, I had a pretty stellar academic record. I had three A's under my belt, and this was at a time when they didn't give out A's like they do now. It was quite rare to get it. Um, I went on, I got a great law degree, then I went further on, I got a distinction in my um, legal practice exams, and I was recruited to one of the top city law firms in London, uh, Norton Europe, where I qualified into corporate finance. I worked both in London and I also worked in Paris. From there, then I went and I joined a US law firm called Whiteman Case, and I worked with them in their London, London office. For me, my life then was pretty good. I was working very hard and I was also playing very hard. Then came my big change in my life, number one. Marriage. Okay? This is something that is a wonderful change, if it's with the right person. So this, this is my husband, Vidika Park. He did not actually live in England, he lived in Moscow. So with marriage also came a move to a new country. I had never in my life have I ever wanted to live in Russia. I liked Russian history, but I did not speak the language. If he had come from, if he was living in France or Germany or even the whole of South America, I could speak those languages. But Russian, I had never learned. So I was a little bit nervous. But the funny thing is, well, if you want to embrace change, the, the easiest way you can embrace it is actually if it's to do with love. Uh, love, they say, moves mountains. So I thought, okay, so what's a little bit of geography? It's okay. So there I was, I left everything that was known to me, my family, my friends, my work. Um, I transferred to our Moscow office um, with Whiten Case, which was great. But I left everything, but I didn't have any fear at all. And I think the, the reason being that I felt that reassured that with this person I could reach my full potential. And this is actually something that I find very interesting and what I want to tell the girls out there in the audience. We tell our girls that, okay, you know, for marriage, look for somebody who is whatever good looking or like doing well for themselves or, you know, these kind of qualities. I think what you should be looking at is somebody who will allow you to reach your full potential in life. 
Because women, just like men, they have a potential. And it is right that you should be able to reach that potential. So here we are, we moved to Moscow. I'm having a great time, I'm working in this law firm, I'm the only UK qualified corporate lawyer over there. So the work that I got was amazing. If I had been in London, I would never have been drafting that kind of documentation. And so then, in my mind, my plan for where I was going to be was that I was going to be this hotshot lawyer, I was going to fly around the world, and you know, I was going to become a partner. And that was how I had envisioned my life. But as my sister tells me, Alia, she always says, if you want to make God laugh, you have to tell him your plans. So I told Alamia my plans, and he had a little bit of a laugh, because then came my next change. Number two, parenting. This is a change that I, of course, embraced wholeheartedly. Having a child is one of the most life-changing things that you can have. Even before birth, um, I was forcibly having to embrace a change. Any women here who've had children will know what I'm talking about. The nausea, the um, mood swings, every single thing. But it was something that was wonderful. Um, I, at that time, I had planned that when my son was six months old, I was going to go back to work and I was going to carry on with my partnership dream of being a partner in an international law firm. But then came a change number three. My husband decided that we should move back to Pakistan. Well, for him it was moving back, for me it was moving for the first time ever. This was a much harder change for me to embrace. Um, I'd never lived there. I had family, they were all in Karachi. Um, I was working with an international law firm. There were no international law firms in Lahore. I knew nobody in Lahore. My family, you know, relatives were in Karachi, not here. And the day before I was leaving, I had a lot of, I was anxious. And it was only that a friend of mine who came over and she reassured me. And she said, Why are you getting so worried? You always said that you wanted to live in Pakistan. And I was like, I did. She said, yes, I'm here at university. You always said you wanted to go back, you wanted to help, you wanted to do something for people. She said, this is your opportunity. So then I thought, okay, I should embrace that. So with everything else, I also embraced this with a very positive attitude. Now when I came to Pakistan after settling here, what struck me the most was how um, fortunate I had been. I felt really rich and not terms in, in terms of money, in terms of my education, in terms of my knowledge. And I realized that this Western upbringing of mine had been actually pretty amazing because you know what that Western upbringing told me? It told me that every man is equal. It's an Islamic concept, but you don't see it here in Pakistan. The driver and the master, there's a big difference. The master does not see himself like the driver. The big himself doesn't see himself like the mate. I was brought up in a different place where I believe that I am exactly the same as everybody else. It's just luck where you're born. Everybody should be treated equally. And it was then that I looked at the injustice of that, that I thought that I wanted to actually change what I'm doing. Take a break from law and actually do something which is for social good. So when I was thinking of that, I thought, okay, what is the best way that you can help, like in this country? And for me, it just comes down to education. I lived in Russia, which was a country that is 100% literacy. The amazing amount of people that I met over there. They would know where Pakistan was, they would know where India was, they would know everything. And I always would think that this country is, I mean, at that stage, it's in a real stage of development. But it was my belief that this country, and you can see Russia now, was going to do very well because it had 100% literacy. I mean, that is your biggest asset are your people. If your people are not educated, then you're never going to reach the potential that your country can reach. Pakistan, if you look at our literacy rates, are pathetic. You want this country to do well, then the only way you're going to be able to do, this, to do it well is to educate your masses. Without that, you're never going to get anywhere. No matter how hard everybody else is trying, you will always have this burden to you down. So with that in mind, I decided to join Care Foundation. Care Foundation is an NGO here in Lahore. It educates at least over 180,000 underprivileged children. It takes government schools and it turns them around. I worked with them for two and a half years. I ran their head office. And it gave me a wonderful insight into actually what education is like here. I visited many a government school where there would be children. The children were there. There were just no teachers there. There were kids sitting there waiting for an education which was never going to actually come to them. To me, I just thought that this is actually something that we should really focus on. And it just made my um, belief 
that education is the way forward. It may have been stronger. But then again, we had another change. I had another baby. So I took a little bit of time out, and I decided that I should spend my time with my family and give them the attention they deserve. And everything was happily moving along. And then something happened. It was a change which neither was I going to embrace, neither was it positive, and something had to be done about it. And that was the Taliban in areas of SWAT. They were wreaking havoc with the Nizami. I don't even sign, but there was no stopping. Myself and some friends, we just felt that we had to speak out. So we organized different protests in Lahore, um, which were also uh, mirrored in Karachi. And this is what we did. And then when the IDP situation happened, people just turned up, friends with money. And they said, you know, you guys have been speaking out about this. Why don't you help? So we said, OK, let's do this. And that was how Rising Stars Foundation started. This was formerly known as Pakistan Rising. We, hoped, we helped over 5,000 IDPs who were living with host families at that time. We then helped them relocate back to SWAT when the army operation had finished. At that time, what they told us was, you know, you have to please help us. We have no schools in our area. Me, being the one who was really into education, I said, okay, then we have to do something. If somebody asked us for help. You can't just sit back. You actually have to assist. So with that, we decided that we were going to go into education, and we partnered with Developments and Literacy, another NGO which provides us with all our teacher training and supervision of our schools. Here's just some of our schools here. We run four schools in areas of SWAT, and we also run one in Utshri. Our school in Utshri is actually our largest school with over 400 children. We have a total body of at least um, 1,200 kids. They're all primary schools right now, and they've just been growing organically. So we now are up to grade five. Uh, one of our children in um, uh, uh, Utshri School is scored the highest in the public board examination. So with this in mind, I felt that, okay, this is great. We're doing something. We're helping children. That, that's something that's good. But what about adults? What about a 20-year-old who can't read or write? I mean, really, are they going to have any future, like a good future to speak of? And then I actually, my attention went to women. I saw that for men, even if they're uneducated, there's still like public spaces for them. You go out any market, you will see tons of men. Do you see many women there? No. And I wondered, I wondered how, what are they doing? How are they living their lives? The thought of a woman locked up in four walls really did disturb me a lot. So I thought that is something that we should do and look at women, and that's how Labour and Love started. Labour and Love is a social enterprise. We um, train and teach women in handicraft skills. We make a range of products uh, which we sell. Women are paid for a piece that they make. All monies that are raised go back into our charity. And how did Labour and Love start? Well, actually, when we were doing the Rising Stars Foundation, we needed to raise money for IDPs. So we were all about, you know, I said, you know, we should like, create ownership. We want people to take ownership of their country. You need to create patriotism. Patriotism is a good thing. So I had this idea of like doing like a Pakistan flag t-shirt, like with sequins and stuff. I said, it'd be really cool if people wear that and we'll raise money. And at that same time, my old lady came to see me. And she said that she needed some, she needed money, she needed work. She was always very good at handicraft. So I quickly designed this like Pakistan flag on a t-shirt and I said, can you come back and stitch this on in sequence? Which is what she did. There you go. So these were our patriotic tees. We sold these like pockets. And all profits went for IDPs. For us to meet the demand, she had to train other women in her village. And then this is just exactly how it started. We had 30 women working with us, churning these out. They were paid per piece. We paid them at a rate which was above the market. And I suddenly thought that this is a great way of helping women, helping women to earn an income. We now have stitch centers in uh, Menmukuti and in Shekhupura. A lot of our women work from home. And we give them all the materials at home so they can work in the confines of their home. If, they, if a woman has a lot of time, she can take on a bigger order. If a woman doesn't have so much time, she can do a little bit less. It's not meant to be a burden on a woman. It's meant to help her to earn an income and to become a productive member of society. The impact that we have seen on our women is immense. 
the respect that their husbands have given them now that they are actually also bringing in money into their home is a very welcome thing to see. A lot of women have amazing talent. These are some of our women. This is me opening one of our stitch centers, which is in Nanyu Booty. So we have women who work it from home, as you can see, and generally it will be one lady will have the biggest space in her house, so the women will come there, they'll work all together, and they note down who has made what, and then they get paid for a piece that they make. That's how it works. So the one thing that this Rising Stars Foundation and Labor and Love, what they started to make me think, and what they connected me on, was that I felt that these charities, but they had to work without us having to beg people for money. I, when I worked with care, I didn't really like asking people for money. The funny thing is that my attitude is that I shouldn't have to beg somebody to do something good, right? It's our duty to do good. Why are we here? To help others. That is our reason for being. That is my belief that this is our reason for being. And for me to plead with somebody that please could you sponsor a kid for education, it just seemed very wrong. So, what I thought was that we have to think of very creative ways to raise money where we will be bringing people on, people who wanted to come to us as opposed to us chasing them. So, I looked at Rising Stars Foundation and I decided I love art. Pakistani art is amazing. But we don't have the same sort of like marketing and the international reputation as Indian art. So, I went and I spoke to Bonham's Auction House in London. And I said, hey, how do you feel about us getting together some Pakistani artists? And they will donate art and we'll sell this at Bonhams. So they said, you know, actually, we would love it because we don't have a very big Pakistani -like client base and we would like to grow it. So that is what happened. For the artists themselves, they got the kudos that they were actually selling internationally. We arranged the first event was in 2011. One of our most well-known contemporary artists, Rashid Rana, he very kindly donated one piece for us, which actually raised £16,000. For us, the benefit was that we were going to be selling these artworks in an international market, and hence we were going to be raising the price for those pieces. So, more money was going to come for our charity. The 2011 auction, given that Rashid Rana's piece was 16000 raised over £50,000 for Rising Stars Foundation. With those monies, we were able to run our schools for two years. Again, in 2013, we got more artists on board, and willingly, they came to us because we're like, oh my god, and you're, yeah, we'll be selling at bottoms, this is great. And it also put up their reputation, put up their own prices. And again, we raised 40,000 pounds. The same principle applies to labor and love. Labor and love, what we do is we look at our products. We want to